This month's Where Did the Road Go is sponsored by Tim, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, Stephen St. George, and Lindsay Trebet. Thank you for making this show possible. And if you would like to help support the show, check out www.wheredidtheroadgo.com and click on the Patreon link. It's only $3 a month, and you get extra content all month long. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight I am joined by Taylor, hey. Joshua Cutchen. Good evening. And Barbara Fisher of the Six Degrees of John Keel podcast. Hello, everyone. This is the first time you're joining us for one of these shows. Yes. yes. And, I, and, I, and I really should introduce Taylor as the host of the Green Lion podcast, which is also excellent. <laughs> I was just going to say, <laughs> they all got last names, and apparently I'm just Taylor. You're just Taylor. You're just Taylor. That's okay. That's, I see that on my Skype now. I'll fix it. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like I, Shakira. Yeah, just Taylor. Yeah, there you go. Just a mononym Taylor. Okay, Okay. fine. Taylor Bell. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> of the Green Lion Podcast. So, uh, Josh really wanted to do a show, and I'm always down for that. And uh, he- Go ahead, Josh. I was just going to say, yeah, it, it had been a while, and uh, I like to try to stay relevant and pop on one of these things. I've got a little bit of a lull in what I'm doing now, so I'm like, hey, it's I have time to do a Where to the Road Go. So When are you going to write another up. book? <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Yeah. I, I'm coming out of hibernation like a bear. Like, everything is new again, and it's like I find myself with, like, I found myself jittery because I'm not working on it because <laughs> I've been working on it for about 18 months now. Um, yeah. And now Barbara gets to work on it. I know. It's very exciting. I was working on it before dinner. So, Do you, do you have a title for oh, the book yet? Exciting. Yes. Um, Ecology of Souls. Um, okay. Book, book one and book two. Didn't want to make it two books, but there's no way around it. It's, uh, it's over a quarter of a million words long. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, uh, but it's it's it, I didn't intend for it to turn into Joshua's theory of everything paranormal, but it wound up that way. So it's That's looking right. at uh, yeah, ecology of souls, a new mythology of death and the paranormal. Nice. Yeah. So well, that'll be out sometime later this year, uh, God willing. <laughs> I thought you were just going to end with sometime. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> feels like that sometimes. I mean, my book will be out sometime. True. That's where I'm ending with that. <laughs> In this life or the next, right? It better be this life. Yeah, I'm curious to see which one comes out first. I'm guessing <laughs> probably probably Ecology of Souls. Oh, you yeah. Never know. Almost certainly. Oh, yeah. That's a complete manuscript. Yeah. My, mine's, I, I'm, I'm still going through notes from 1992. Fair enough. And the New Theories book, I actually wrote a bunch on that last night, but uh, my brain was like, put all this on paper, and I wrote, started writing everything down, and it's like, okay, I'm done. Just, just make notes from there on. It's like, oh, you just gonna stop <laughs> so. yeah i tell you what it's uh the the research slash you know um preparation portion is just as arduous if not more than the than the writing portion because oh, you yeah. kind of feel like you're you feel like you're treading water you know you're like well hey well i know this now but i've got to get it down on the page and yeah well, that, and I, as I do research, I'm like, oh, now I got to find that and look that up. And I got to look that up. And I got I to remember yep. exactly what that is. So I got to look that up. Yep. I understand that. There, there was a reference to T.C. Lethbridge uh, that was similar to something I was writing about. Someone mentioned that. And I went, cool. What do I have from T.C. Lethbridge? Not that. Cool. These are impossible to find. Oh, yeah. That's why you guys just need to switch to fiction. It's so much easier. <laughs> true. Very, very true. Yeah, I was talking to somebody about that, and I think I've talked to Barbara about this in the past, too. It's just, I, I, I've i got to get characters that are vibrant enough to have a life of their own so that they can tell me what to do. Yeah, <laughs> because, like, yeah. pulling stuff go. out of thin air is not something I'm prepared to do yet. What you need is to get a character that will speak to you first person in your head. Yeah. So, that's that's what you need to do. And, and essentially what happens is you make a tulpa that lives in your head. Yeah. 
and oh, you let them yeah. talk. Yeah, I'll never forget. That's what George R. R. Martin was saying when people were criticizing him about the length of his books and stuff. He's like, I can't, I can't control where they're telling me to go. It's just like <laughs> this is just where they, this is where they go next. You know. Well, it's it's the uh, it's the daemon. Yeah. Hundred So, so our starting point for this show, uh, Josh suggested, should be the Wild Hunt. Uh, yeah, we sort of <laughs> got there uh, through a circuitous route, but um, <clears throat> the Wild Hunt, uh, for people who don't know, is a Western European phenomena. Um, probably most famously um, in uh, Teutonic countries and Norse countries. Um, not a universal a motif. Um, because you don't find it really, you find spectral riders, but you don't find something really approximating the wild hunt in places like Australia or Africa or the new world. But, um, so it's probably as Ronald Hutton would argue a post Christian amalgamation of several pre Christian pagan ideas. But, um, Mm -hmm. the roughest idea is that, uh, there is a retinue of riders, um, who traverse the sky. um, there's some debate about that, whether they traverse the sky or they just sort of hop from, um, from location to location through the sky, um, um, that are led by a figure, typically a psychopomp or other deity, um, the wild hunt in its purest form. They're probably riding forest animals. Although you see a lot of other horsemen, you know, actually on, on horse steeds as well. Um, but the reason that we got here is because there is, some really interesting uh, connections. There are some really interesting connections between that and Harlequin figures of all things. And when I found this out, it really blew my mind and it's, it's in a chapter um, towards the end of the first book. Um, But uh, yeah, I I just thought it was something that's an interesting bit of folklore that doesn't really get talked about that much. And you can, you can perceive aspects of, trooping fairies in the wild hunts course over the landscape. You can perceive aspects of ley lines. You can perceive aspects of, of UFOs as well. And I just thought it would be something interesting to talk about. In addition to the fact that, uh, you know, I've looked at a lot of stories about the wild hunt and you don't find a lot of them outside Europe and you don't find a lot of them in the modern era with the exception of our lovely Barbara Fisher, who has a story that I would feel relatively comfortable putting in that sort of spectral horseman, uh, wild hunt category. If, uh, if you're willing to share that Barbara. Sure. Well, before sure. you do that, I'd, I'd also like to point out there is the Johnny cash song ghost yes. riders in the sky. Ghost riders right. In yeah. The sky. And ghoul yeah, town yes. did a ghoul town did a play on that too. So Lyle Blackburn kind of, kind of took off from that as well. Yeah. And, and so you'll find this, you know, I mean, in Germany, it was der Vode tut. No, no, sorry. That was the meant that Odin was writing, but, um, uh, you'd find Odin at the head of this. So Oscar, um, sometimes you'd find, uh, uh, Gwen up and his wish hounds, um, leading the wild hunt. So yeah, it's a lot of, Western European stuff. And then you have, yeah, it, it sort of gets reinvented in that ghost riders in the sky, um, mythos as well, which you're, you're exactly right. That's very prescient. That's exactly drawing on the same archetype. And right, right mm-hmm. before this, we also mentioned the, the Magnus archives, which apparently I think I'm the only one here who's listened to, uh, has a, has a strong, uh, that's one of the themes in the, in the podcast is the wild hunt. So, but Barbara, please tell us your story. All right. So this happened, let's see around 1994. Um, we had just moved into a house that was out in the country that we called the falling down the hill house. Ah. Uh, this is outside of Athens, Ohio, uh, which it sounds like it's out in the middle of the boonies, but really if you go five minutes outside of Athens, Ohio, it's, it's farmland and forest and that's all it is. And we loved it. It was a beautiful house. Well, actually the house kind of sucked, but we loved the (laughs) 13 acres of land that it was on. That was beautiful. It was all rolling hills, uh, hay fields with a big swath of woods up at the top of the hill. And uh, one of the, this wasn't one of the first things that that happened there. Pretty much we, we started hearing music was the first thing that started happening there. We'd hear music coming from outside. And at first we were like, oh, It must be the neighborhood hippies. They're playing drums and flutes and singing. And uh, okay, it's the pagans. 
<laughs> and and then we realized, no, wait, we're the neighborhood pagans and hippies. So and it's not us. And then we realized that, you know, we'd hear it inside, we'd go outside, and it would stop. Or we couldn't hear it. And then we'd go inside and we could hear it again. This is not natural behavior. Yeah. Um, one night, and it was a full moon night, it was in I'm pretty sure it was the fall. It wasn't near um, Halloween or, or Samhain, but it, I think it was in, you know, the first, the beginnings of fall. Still had leaves on the trees. It was very, very damp out. So the hayfield, which had been cut, was was muddy at this point. And we were asleep, sound asleep, and it was warm enough that we had the windows open with the screens in. And we both woke up to the sound of, of horses racing past our window. And we were like, it's three in the morning. Who is out in our, you know, yard and in our field riding horses? And so, you know, we go to the window and we look out and there's nothing. But we can still hear them streaming past. We could hear the hoofbeats. We could hear, we couldn't hear people talking. We could hear the horses whinnying. We could hear the hoofbeats. We could hear the clink of uh, the ba- the bits, like snaffle bits that are two pieces. And then we could hear the squeak of, of weight shifting on a saddle. Um, both Zach and I rode horses, so we, we knew those sounds really, really well. And we just looked at each other and we were like, oh, no. And uh, I said, I should go out and get the dog. And he was like, no, you should not go outside. <laughs> because that's the wild hunt. And I'm like, yeah, but they might get our dog. He's like, mm, too bad. <laughs> you don't need to go out there. And what's interesting is my husband is not someone who sees things. And he generally isn't one to experience much of anything. But he very much heard it that night. And the thing that bothered him the most was he could hear the sound of the tack, the jingle of the tack, and the squeak of, of the leather saddles. Yeah, those are that, pretty distinctive sounds. Yeah, that really bugged him. And it seemed like they were riding right past our window. And in fact, he shut the window. He was he was like having none of it. No, we're not going out there. They didn't take the dog, thankfully. Good. Uh, but good. the but the next day I went out and I was like, I got to see if they're hoof beat, you know, hoof prints. And I found a couple. Um they were really small. They weren't deer hoof prints. They were they were horse hoof prints but there was only two and they were in squishy ground that was you know i was making footprints on so if it was a horse you know it would sink deeper but yeah that that weirded me out i was like okay well that's fascinating and so that was it i didn't i didn't think too hard about it after that and no uh no bad luck Afterwards, I take it. Uh, or, well, you know, I'm trying I mean, to think it, if there was anything it, in particular. It was a really crap time in our lives. So, yeah, you could say there was bad luck, but I don't think it was brought to us by that. But I think it was it was just, you know, there was bad luck around us and maybe that's what drew it to us. Is is bad luck commonly associated with the wild hunt? If you see it, you see, but okay. maybe maybe we escaped that because we didn't actually see it; we heard it. Right. But yeah. For it. it it was. It's not uncommon to have, especially in you know when you hear about the the sounds of the wild hunt, which is one of the ways it manifests more than being seen. Um, yeah, you hear not, it from the sky. Yeah, it's it's not uncommon for somebody to hear it above a house where there is a death that occurs. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Um, okay. That makes sense. Like, like, so like, like everything paranormal. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's, that's absolutely fascinating. And it's got, you know, that bit about the limited number of hoof prints has got, you know, some of those lovely Bigfoot hallmarks of the, right. uh, of the, oh, yeah. the solitary footprints or the, the in, you know, abruptly ending trackway and all that sort of thing as well. Now I will tell you one that I haven't told Josh, and in fact, I don't generally tell people, but at this point, I've given up on worrying about if people think I'm crazy or not. Um, 
because I don't think I'm crazy and most people don't think I am. But so a few years before that, um, I was involved in a very contentious divorce with uh, Morgana's father and his family and my family and him were doing all kinds of really horrible things. And they were, you know, um, stalking people like me and, uh, you know, following me around and, and just being really frightening and, and scary. So oh. at one point, we called the wild hunt and basically pointed in um, my ex-husband's direction. I do not recommend this to anyone ever to do this. I was young, I was angry, and I was stupid. Um, but I will say that uh, he he got caught in a storm not long after that, and a big tree branch uh, fell on top of his car. So, just saying. Well, and you know, as with so many of these phenomena, um, the association of storms is is mm -hmm. definitely a uh, definitely another marker. And, and to the extent that you know, in some parts of uh, some parts, I believe in in some of the Germanic countries, it was advised that you you know fall basically onto your belly to prevent yourself from being smote by Odin, because Odin would like you know the the wild yes. hunt would take off your head. At, if you were standing up, yes. Um, which some people say, oh, well, that's an expression of people being afraid of of lightning, right? If you if you right, yeah, if you're in an open field, that's your safest bet to not get struck by lightning is to make yourself flat. But what's interesting about that to me is that you see that exact same thing um, in tales of the night marchers in Hawaii that you should yeah. you know prostrate yourself, mm -hmm. which is sort of a missing four one one thing. We're not going to go down that rabbit hole on the, on the veracity of missing four one one. We're not going to do that tonight, but um, still it's, it's, it's thematically um, consistent. And uh, you know, what's even, even more interesting is there um, the academic article from which that particular citation regarding the the uh the night marchers that i'm thinking of um originates also mentions that the, he has a the, the night marchers have a herald that will show up and tell everyone to you know get out of the way because the night marchers are coming and you know i'll be damned if uh, you don't see that exact same character in a lot of the germanic hunts it's yeah. usually known as the uh the eckhart who is an old man who comes who comes through and precedes the wild hunt and says you know all sinners get out of the way um, because the wild hunt's coming on, it's on its way here. So, um, yeah, that, you, know, you know, that's the sort of thing that really gets my motor revving <laughs> um, is when you see little thematic bits like that that pop up across cultures that really shouldn't have had any sort of cross-contamination. No, no. They're, they're very far apart. And the whole point of the wild hunt was to gather souls. Right. Okay. I was going to ask, like, what... What is the point of this <laughs> phenomena? What is the, it trying to do? The, the whole point of the paranormal is to get <laughs> there. Wow. So, uh, you know, th that's just my completely biased way that I think nowadays. But yeah, um, generally speaking, to gather souls. So you can see comparisons there that are very easy to make to the uh, to the fairy raids that you would find in Scotland mm -hmm. that would be gathering souls to to give them to uh, as their tithe their tithe to hell every seven years. So they don't have to give their own people, right? Okay. Like I said, Taylor, you know more about the wild hunt than you think. <laughs> like, well, so you, you did say that, and I'm as you're talking about this, I am remembering certain things about, you know, pop culture stuff, right, and stuff that I've yeah, sort of seen no. or heard, and it feels a lot simpler than I, I guess I was making it in my head. Um, but I'm just trying to wrap my head around like where this comes from, why, I mean, you know. If it was with anything with the paranormal, why, right? Why does it happen? Who knows? But like, I don't know, like Barbara, why do you think that it showed up to you in 1994? Do you think it was some kind of a return from what you had done or do you think it, it was unrelated? I think it, I think it probably was a return from what I had done. You know, generally, generally you make a, a deal with, um, non-human intelligences if you initiate contact with them that's mm -hmm. generally what you do and we did make a deal um i didn't say i was gonna you know give up firstborn or anything like that because that's what i was trying to avoid <laughs> but, 
but I I did say that I would owe them a debt. And so I said it, and so it happened. Mm -hmm. Um, And one could say that some of the outcome of the divorce case might be considered payment of that debt. So, you know, it didn't turn out perfectly well, certainly not early on. Um, So there was that. But, you know, one of the things that's interesting about the wild hunt is it is a it is a a hunting for souls. It's it's uh, the the deity, the psychopomp, uh, the the spirits that gather around it, the lost spirits. And they they basically go out and anybody who's abroad at that night is in danger of being mm-hmm. taken by them, you know, and in that sense, it is like the the fairy raids or, you know, the story of Tam Lin, who, you know, they, they the queen of the fairies stole him. This is in Scotland. And she kept him around because he was such a pretty knight. He was he was lovely and gorgeous. And she was then going to keep, she kept him for seven years and then she had to pay her tithe to hell on the seventh year. So she was going to, you know, hand him over. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, keeping with those fairy themes, there was certainly a, you'll find some indication that there was a prescribed pathway for the hunt, much like the trooping fairies in in Ireland. Mm -hmm. Um, To the extent that, you know, they would say don't erect a structure in the, in the pathway of this. Um, and of course in Ireland to this day, you can find houses that have had the corner lopped off because somebody made an addition to their house and didn't consult their local cutting man or cutting woman, um, sure. and determine, you know, that, Oh, this is a fairy path. So, you know, people, yeah. have, really? people build, build a house. Yeah. They build a house and they'd have poltergeist phenomena and illness in their home. And then they'd find out, Oh, well, the reason is because you're obstructing a fairy path, which oftentimes connected. There's some indication, not particularly strong, but Paul Devereaux found some indication that these fairy paths connected, ancient monuments, which ties into the whole ley line thing. Right. Um, well, Devereaux was also connecting fault lines with this stuff. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, he had a, he had a, a little bit has, I guess, since he's still around, um, yeah. but he has a little bit more patience for Persinger than, uh, than I do nowadays. Um, primarily because Michael Persinger's research has not been replicated. Um, no, not, not in any great extent. Yeah. Um, and, if, and if anybody's wondering, this is Michael Persinger who thought that uh, perhaps uh, electromagnetic anomalies at along fault lines could produce not only earth lights, but could influence individuals' perception at, you know, along these sacred sites um, and, you know, basically cause what, for all intents and purposes, would be hallucin- hallucinations. Um, that is a little bit of a fallacy, in my opinion, even if it is true, the idea that you're saying, oh, it's just a hallucination yeah. is just like saying, you know, a uh, psychedelic trip is just a hallucination. Like, that's right. a little bit of a, a fallacy. But um, Well, Sh- Cheryl Lee worked with him, too, and uh, I don't remember. I, I know she had some respect for his, the way he did things, but I, I want to say that he also went by the, the, the book for the most part, but maybe had some, some, you know, other ideas that he wasn't putting out there scientifically. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've had, I've there are some things that I can't quite talk about um, that have sort of colored my impression as well. Uh, um, okay, and and I can't say I, mean, I can't say that it's not valid or or even helpful or useful research. I mean, you know, even Keel was looking at uh, whether or not you know there might be some epilepsy connection uh, oh, to yeah. all these things, and which you know, is completely you know that was Mircea Eliade's primary um, primary mode by which you know shamans reached ecstasy in his in his mind was through epilepsy now obviously that's not true but it's still another uh lasting connection between those these different phenomena um and, that, that's worth mentioning and also epilepsy and kundalini have very similar uh manifestations at times yes yep and for what it's worth i mean you know all of these things whether it's a religious experience or a you know even you mentioned like psychedelic trip or experiencing the wild hunt or something like that involves human perception right i mean mm-hmm. all of these things boil down to you experiencing something that has some sort of greater usually symbolic meaning um i don't know i, I guess i'm not super familiar with epilepsy or if there are things associated with that um in that capacity it, it's a type of epilepsy called temporal lobe epilepsy yeah. and it can give you hallucinations of lights 
um, a sensation of there being a presence with you that may or may not be invisible. Sometimes you see uh, auras around people. I know somebody who has temporal lobe epilepsy and he, he basically says, you know, at one minute he's there physically in a space talking mm-hmm. with someone or, you know, just going about his day. And then suddenly his brain checks out and, and okay. there's maybe a few lights. It doesn't sound like the kinds of things that, you know, shamanic practitioners experience, or it's certainly nothing like I've experienced with psychedelics at all. So it, yeah. it, it, it certainly doesn't sound that way. And that's, I think one of the, pra- one of the things, I mean, we can we can criticize Eliad's handling of Australian and African cultures. That there's certainly some room for criticism there, but I think it's probably the most enduring shortcoming of his legacy. And you know, his I mean, he's he literally like wrote the urtext for the West's interpretation of shamanism. But he mm-hmm. he really seemed to place a strong emphasis on these epileptic states, and that's just not that's just not the case um, throughout all these different modalities. And of course, Streber, um, Streber also thought he had temporal lobe epilepsy when he started having his encounters. He, he thought he did. And he got a, he, uh, he, he got a, an MRI and, and found out that <laughs> this is such a Whitley thing to say that he had an abnormally normal brain or something like that. <laughs> yeah. an ab- abnormally stable brain, I think is, is the way he worded it. But um, he, uh, he said that, that that may be the case, but not in the presence of of UAP radiation, is what he said at the time. So it's like, okay, that's that, that's that's kind of where I think what is a is a useful way to look at it. Um, but uh, regarding you know, sort of circling back around to the uh, to the wild hunt, um, uh, I. F- there's something else that's interesting that is sort of <laughs> the, the backstory for this episode of where Did the road go is just as fascinating as the show y'all, because it's been a very circuitous route that we've taken here. Um, but uh, there is some really fascinating uh, etymological links between one of the earliest characters that drives the wild hunt and uh, basically clowns. Um, uh, so yeah, the wild hunt was, was led by a multitude of figures. Sometimes within the same culture, there would be different figures depending on whom you, whom you'd ask and what time of year it was happening, et cetera. Um, again, the wild hunt is probably a connection of, you know, a lone spectral huntsman roving for souls in the, in the woods. And it's probably also, a uh, uh, synchronization with earlier pagan motifs of these, uh, beneficial women who come into homes at night and, and, uh, receive offerings that have been left out for them, you know, shades of Santa Claus and, uh, Perch. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Perked, uh, um, uh, Santa Claus, I mean, is the wild hunt, right? I mean, he's got his, yeah, <laughs> he's got his reindeer. Right. He's got his reindeer. He's Odin. He supervises the dead in the form of the elves, you know, <laughs> it's Swans the sky. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so the wild hunt is, is, is a conflation of a lot of things, but one of the earliest um, accounts of the hunt uh, comes from a um, comes from an individual by the name of, of Valshanen. Um It's a it's a Germanic account from uh, 1092, and he said that he saw this giant at the head of the uh, wild hunt. This is a land bound wild hunt. Um, It's sort of a procession of the dead, but it's the same motif. Um, And uh, this, this club wielding giant, he identified uh, by the name of um, Herlikin, which uh, there's, we're going to have a little bit of a, (laughs) of a language lesson here. Um, uh, What's her name? Uh, Nancy, I believe it's Nancy Cassiola has written a, love, a wonderful book on uh, medieval uh, art surrounding death. And uh, she sort of took the Herlichen or Herlichen uh, word apart from uh, signifying old high German Hari trooper army and basically thing. So her, her, Herlichen. So um, from this, we can go a couple of different directions. Um, one of the things that she pointed out, which I think is especially fascinating, is that uh, she believes that there is some reflexive quality in Valshanen identifying, identifying Herlishen as the 
um, leader of the wild hunt in terms, basically in other words, saying that it might've been a double of himself. So that opens up a whole new <laughs> avenue that you can approach this topic from, you know, the idea of a double, like a doppelganger, but that's also a giant, you know, there's, there's a rabbit hole that you can go down there with, regarding fairies and whatnot. Um, but I think most pertinent to sort of where we began our discussion in arriving at this topic is that, uh, Herlish and, um, was, uh, was another term that, um, was became appended to demons. Um, because sometimes the dead that were in the wild hunt were demons or the dead. Those two ideas become quite interchangeable, especially in medieval thought. Um, you know, a lot of times the wild hunt, especially in its land bound form served as sort of a mobile purgatory for folks to sort of expiate their sins. But, uh, so you have this, this is some um, Herlishin, um, or Herlequin, uh, associated with demons, which people like Dante picked up and used as a name for demons in like the Inferno Alishino, um, which is where we got Harlequin because Harlequin is a trickster and demons were tricksters as well. Um, so mm-hmm. that's, that's, that's an interesting little um, chain of custody there. But also um, I find this especially fascinating as well. Um, Harlequin is also related to the idea of uh Herla King, King Herla, um, who was a, Sort of, uh, sort of proto Arthurian figure, um, basically sort of like a Germanic Arthurian figure in a lot of ways, who went underground, um, had a meeting with the dwarf king underneath a mountain, and when he emerged, um, he found out he, he he and his company emerged after their meeting with the dwarf king on horseback, and uh, a dog leapt off of one of the horses. When the dog touched the ground, the dog cr- crumbled into dust, and and Herla said. We spent, you know, it was basically the first, one of the earliest, if not the first medieval recording of, of missing time. Um, the idea that they had spent, you know, eons in the company of the dwarf and king. And if they dismounted from their horses, they would all crumble into dust. So this is King Herla, which we can see in that sort of Harlequin, Herla King um, idea as well. But also uh, Harlequin is tied into uh, uh, Earl King, the Earl, uh, Earl Koenig. Um, the uh, the king of the fairies who would abduct uh, children as well. So um, the Harlequin, by way of the Harlequin clowns, um, become the these sort of trickster fairy wild hunt death symbols um, in a really fascinating way. Thank you for thank you for attending my TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is it is fascinating, and I'm I'm just kind of trying to piece together the different symbolism that's coming together in these things. And what you mentioned about Santa Claus being sort of, you know, symbolic, the wild hunt, it's, it's really interesting how pervasive these themes are, but they show up in different ways. Right. And they, there's sort of some common threads, but they appear differently in, in different cultures and different times with different names. You know, it's, I don't know. It's interesting. Well, and and then there, there's the whole, you know, synchronization idea too, that these things, because I mean, you know, what, what a lot of people will do, especially with the Santa Claus thing is they'll say, Oh, well, Santa Claus is Odin and his, uh, his steed is Sleipnir. But then in the same, you know, because, uh, Sleipnir was Odin's eight legged horse and Santa has a tiny reindeer. And, you know, that's obviously very much the truth. I, I can find, like I said, connections between the elves and the dead and Odin is the psychopomp who's leading the dead or supervising mm-hmm. the dead. So, so it's all very consistent in that respect, but in the same breath, people will say, and you know, the Santa Claus gets his coloring from Amanita Muscaria and you're like, oh, okay, well there's probably some Amanita use amongst the Norse, but then they'll say in Siberian shamans use reindeer. And you're like, okay, we're mixing and matching a lot of different, sure. Yep. A lot of different folklores here. Um, but isn't that what happens? It all kind of, well, exactly, exactly. It, it, it is what happens. Um, but it does make for sort of a, a messy um, stew when you're trying to separate out its constituent elements and sort of find the earliest or, or proto version of these these ideas. And where does Krampus come into all that? <laughs> uh, you know, Krampus comes in with Perkta. Yeah, I mean, I think oh, that's interesting. But she yeah, sometimes you, leads the wild hunt, too. 
She does. Um, and she can be rightly seen as a psychopomp herself because as Timothy Renner mentioned in, uh, where the footprints in volume one, uh, she has two, uh, aspects of her retinue. One of which are the Perkton, which are the hairy wild men that are often look just like Krampus, but also the, uh, the Heimchen, uh, which are the souls of unbaptized children. Um, sometimes they water the, uh, the crops with their tears. So for to pulls double duty as a fertility goddess in that respect. Um, but, uh, the, uh, the Heimchen themselves appear as ghost lights or will the wisps. So mm-hmm. you've got, you know, the Bigfoot, the woman in white and, uh, and ghost lights and the dead always with the dead. Right. Um, yep. Yep. All, all, all wrapped up in this, uh, together. Also um, Heimchen, interestingly, since I'm reading your book, um, Heimchen is the German word for cricket. Hmm. Crickets make chirping noises. And there's a part of your book where you're talking about the dead shrinking into these, these tiny beings and these weird yes. chirping, mm-hmm. clicking, whistling sounds. Yeah, that was that was one of the main ways that uh, in classical cultures uh, that that they thought that the uh, ghost sounded as they sounded like chirping or or, or whirring or buzzing, which mm-hmm. you know brings us into not not quite Oz Factor stuff, um, but but stuff similar to that, and also some of the sounds reported at the beginning of, of near death experiences. Um, that's interesting. Not to keep playing the syncretism game, but you know, I'm just still mulling over some of this stuff in my head, and I'm thinking about Odin and Odin's connections with, like, um, you know, uh, Hermes and Mercury, and sort of this, um, you know, being a being associated with magic, but also kind of uh, the sort of trickster elements of those things, and how that plays into um, some of the Harlequin stuff as well, well or, or the clown stuff. Well, the Odin thing, this, this blew my mind. I'm like, why haven't I thought of this before? But, uh, so what day is named after Odin in our calendar? Wednesday. Wednesday. What is that in Spanish? Anybody? Mercredi. Nope. That's Mi- French. <laughs> yeah, well, French. no, we, but same idea. Miracle. Um, yeah. and what's that named after? Mercury. 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 Right. And what day of the week is Wednesday? The middle, the middle day of the week, the liminal right. day of the week. And what did John Keel say? The Wednesday phenomena. Yeah, which Wednesday is why. phenomena. UFOs appear most on Wednesdays, and yep. this, and the same thing with uh, with fairy lore. They used to say that uh, fairies were most like Wednesday was the fairies' day in a lot of uh, British cultures. Mm-hmm. I wonder if I wonder if anyone has has checked that research with today's list of UFO resp- you know encounters. I'm not sure. It we're working on. Oh, it. Yeah, Bar- oh, Barbara's yeah. trying. <laughs> yeah, we're yeah, working on it. It's, it's a work in progress. Well, that'll be interesting. I forgot you were doing that. Yeah. What exactly well, are you are, are you it. doing, Barbara? Tell people. What? Why, why don't you tell people exactly what you are doing? Okay. So uh, I was reading Albert Rosales' wonderful Humanoid Encounters books. There's like 17 of them, and there's thousands of encounters in there that he has curated. So he's he's gathered them from various sources. He's checked them out. Uh, I very much trust his his work. He's been doing this since 1993. Mm-hmm. But if you read his books, they become this they become overwhelming very, very quickly because there's no way in my mind to really take all of that that information. There's a huge amount of information, and there's no way to analyze it very easily. Because there is so much of it. Yeah. And so I'm reading it and I'm like, ah, this needs analyzed. Why? You know, data without analysis is basically worthless. And oh my God. And so I started getting, you know, the post it notes and, and everything. And I was going to put a map and have pins with yarn and look like the crazy guy. <laughs> and, and yeah, and have pictures pinned to the wall. And then I was like, oh, you big dummy. It's the 21st freaking century. So I I started talking to Morgana. I'm like, do you know anybody who, who like is a computer scientist? And she said, oh yeah, Chris is. And I was like, I thought he was a historian because when I met him, the first thing we started talking about was world war two, because you know, that's what we did. And she was like, no, no, no. He, he, he's a, he's got a PhD in physics and, and, and computer science. And I was like, really cool so i invited him to dinner (laughs) and uh i talked him into this (laughs) um so he's basically building a database and well the database itself is built he has that built but basically 
now we can go through all of Rosales' work because I also contacted Albert and I said, hey, can we do this? Can we use your data? I'm not going to just like snag your data and use it without asking. And because we asked so nicely, he gave us all of his data, which yeah. includes Ooh. stuff that's not in the books. Like, yeah, the, the, it, the stuff too weird for the books. <laughs> there, there is so much, and he keeps he keeps updating us with more. So what that's Chris did is he built the database, and then he used machine learning and um, natural language processing to create it such that you can input things like a state, say Ohio, because that's where I am. So you can get all of the reports that are from Ohio of humanoid encounters, and then you can parse it out with encounters with a UFO, encounters with a hairy hominid, encounters with a so-called fairy, encounters with no UFO. You can do it across time, so you can pick a year. And we now have a mapping uh, process where you can see them come up in time and space. So you can have them pop up on the map where they happen across a span of time. Yeah. So he's doing Very all cool. kinds of stuff. It's pretty amazing. And I can't they, take know, credit for it. it. It goes into, you know, the complexity of like, you have all these different accounts and they're labeled in these different types and they're all over different places and times or, or you know, um, but let's say in, in the natural language of it, you've got accounts that reference things like lights. Well, lights come into play in a lot of different things, including, you know, Harry hominid encounters and UFOs and Fae and ghosts and all these different things. But there are also a lot of those encounters that don't have lights, right? So you can, you can pull it out into just the ones that do or look even further into that and just the ones that are talking about um you know like um like the word light comes up this is one of the things that kind of made the natural language click in my head was the word light can come up in a lot of different contexts right like it could mean illumination but it could also be referring to the weight of something uh, or it could be referring to something catching on fire so there's, or, or there's coloration yeah yeah right yeah. exactly so piecing through using this machine learning to piece through the different way that these these ideas are being talked about in each of these encounters and draw comparisons between them and then look at things you know like for instance the Wednesday phenomena you know uh, or or whatever or um, Barbara you've mentioned multiple times um, like uh, geological information um, right. Right. Quartz or marble, or, or you know, or you could look at uh, at storms, or you could plot it against UFO uh, flaps that are known throughout time, or you know, you could even go, uh, you could plot certain um, elements against, let's say, historical events that have happened mm -hmm. in, in certain places and in, in time, and um, it's just it's incredible. There's so much you can do with the data if you have tools that can handle it and well, like she was saying we have you know we're li living in the 21st century now we do have tools that can handle this stuff the question becomes uh and I'm, I'm, so yeah this is an amazing project it's it's something that needs to be done um but the question that i always have is like okay once you find these once you find a pattern <laughs> <laughs> what are what are new what are new accounts going to do to that to that data like is is the yes. phenomena going to react you know mm -hmm. well it, and and i think this is exactly why it's beautiful that this idea and this um project is being discussed amongst like these groups of people because i think you're absolutely right and it, ultimately what will probably happen is we will learn more about patterns and about the ways that these things interact together but invariably probably there will be exceptions oh, yeah. and what does that tell us well right no. it's it's sort of like with it's sort of like when magic doesn't work and you have to sort of be <laughs> like well why didn't this work you know <laughs> but, but I, I don't think that it's not working you know what i mean like i i see what you're saying but i think it's almost trying to get at the heart of it in a different angle like there's something mm -hmm. else going on that we are we you know 
as humans, we're trying to look at this stuff through the lens of analysis, and we're trying to find the patterns and trying to put together all the things which are there. We can look at those at those patterns, and we may be able to tell very interesting things from them. But there is something else going on with this capricious um, phenomenon, right? That that is almost transcendent of those patterns. And maybe yes. we can get a little closer to that. But let's not mm. forget that some of those encounters are likely to not be real too. Which yeah. Will- and, and that's part of why we don't, we're, we're putting it on a website so that people can, you know, analyze the data themselves and mm-hmm. put in their own queries. Originally we were going to have it so that you could add data to it. But I was like, you know, after I looked at all of the data that, that Albert had gone through himself. I was like, I am not going to let just every Tom, Dick and, and dingbat put anything they want in there without it being curated. (laughs) Well, just not, I'm not, (laughs) you're going to get trolls who are just going to add noise intentionally. I mean, yeah, that's, it's unfortunate, but well, and and the, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Which is why when I'm, you know, when we are ready to get other data sets, I'm going to go to people that I trust and organizations that I trust for them to have curated their data properly right. and not just, you know, be like, woo, we're going to write down everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, and you know, the doubly frustrating thing about that and uh, is that some of the stuff that Albert has in there, um, you start to notice a trend after you sort of go through it enough and that like, the stuff from Latin America and the stuff from the Eastern Bloc countries mm-hmm. is so absolutely crazy that it has to be true, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, uh, and it's just it's just the flavor of of a lot of those stories. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, like, it's I don't even you know even with the data that we have, there's 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 like you said, like you said, Soraya, there's probably plenty of of fabrications, but. You know, again, I'm of the position now where the weirder the story is, the less likely it is yes. to be fabricated. Yeah. Because if you're going to um, fabricate a story, you're going to fabricate something that sounds believable. Right. Mm-hmm. I saw a light, and they took me aboard the craft, and they, you know, stuck a they stuck an X in my Y. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so let's get back to clowns. 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 Since you brought up clowns before we went off into this. Um, <laughs> I mean, the clown is a trickster figure in so many cultures. Trickster figure, um, something that David Metcalf pointed out to me, which I hadn't really considered, was that it's also, you know, a plague figure. It's it's the rictus grin. The rictus of, grin, yeah, the death's yeah. head, you know, the white makeup for a dead body. Mm. Yeah, so if you're um, afraid of clowns. Black you around have- <laughs> the eyes is a skull. Yeah. So if you're afraid of clowns, it's for a good reason, folks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, before we run off to clowns, though, I wanted to point out to Taylor, have you ever seen Fantasia? Yes. It has a depiction of the wild hunt in it. Oh, interesting. Night on Bald Mountain is a depiction of the wild hunt. And if you watch it very, very carefully, you will see various uh, characters that are very familiar. You will see a nude woman riding on the back of a boar. That's Freya. Um, you will see, you know, witches flying on brooms. You'll see Odin, you'll see an eight legged horse. So it, it's in there, but it goes very quickly. So, you know, I remember years and years ago with the videotape, you know, hitting pause and looking at it and (laughs) rewind and all that stuff. But that is basically a wild hunt. So there you go. There's There's a depiction of it. I don't that know if I'd ever, was. yeah, I don't know if I'd ever put that together, Barbara, but you're exactly right. Yep. I I probably have not seen, fan- actually, I watched it in college, um, but before that, I probably hadn't seen it since I was a kid. And I remember, I, I just Googled um, Night on Bald Mountain because I don't know it by name, but I definitely remember this imagery. And I remember uh, this being my favorite sequence in that in that film. Oh, yeah, it's my favorite, too. <laughs> And the uh, the deity at the head of uh, down on Bald Mountain is not the devil, as many people would have you believe. It is um, this poorly understood Slavic deity named Chernabog. Um, Cherna being 
the opposite of Biela. Um, so it's so dark. black. Yeah. Dark. Yeah, exactly. Dark. It would be his, his, um, his alter ego is Biela bog. Um, so like white or light God or, or whatever, but, um, very little, not a lot to talk about with, with him. Um, it's so kind of like was, prom. He's, he's dark yeah, yeah. and cathonic <laughs> and, and, and that's all you know about him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, he, uh, so, uh, what's, what was, um, I think uh, not on Bald Mountain. I think was Mazorsky, and uh, there's yeah. a there's a part for Bielabog in Rimsky Korsakov's Mulata, the opera. Um, and mm-hmm. beyond that, like it's it's kind of hard to find a lot about that figure. Oh, but but Chernobyl. Yep. Yeah. Comes exactly. From the same root word. Yeah. Chern mm-hmm. meaning dark. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think about oh. that. I think about that a lot too. And uh, yeah, oh prob- yeah, as soon as. As soon as I heard where the meltdown was happening, I'm like, well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Duh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, as long as we're on the topic of Chernobyl, um, probably no Mothman around Chernobyl. Sorry, folks. Um, yeah. about, that was too good folk? to be true. That, that, that was just propaganda from the, the movie. Well, so, oh, that's, so that's right. Lauren Coleman talked to Keel and even Keel himself was like, I don't know where people got this from. And Nick Redfern tracked it down. He thinks to an afterward from a later edition of the Mothman prophecies where Keel mentions in the same paragraph, unrelated, uh, basically small towns with nuclear reactors suffering the same twilight zone phenomena that plagued point pleasant. And from there, it seems like that got turned into Chernobyl. That was, that was Nick's contention. Um, so, as I know when the, when the movie came out, that was one of their points of propaganda was all oh, Mothman's been seen in all these other places too. And I was kind of well, like, yeah, that's, that's not how that works. Well, there's some, there's some interesting stuff from Fukushima, um, mm-hmm. just before that meltdown. Um, I don't know how, you know, it's, it's the internet era. So everything you've just got to take with a giant grain of salt, unfortunately. Um, yeah. But, but there's some interesting stuff. Uh, regarding that as a possibility, but yeah, I think if the whole Mothman is a harbinger of doom thing is kind of overblown because uh, it doesn't really seem like anything happened in Chicago post uh, post Chicago sightings and what was that 2017? <laughs> Unless we want to count, you know, <laughs> our current hellscape that we live in. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I've I've always had my doubts about the the Mothman in Chicago sightings. Um, not necessarily that people were seeing saying that, but that it was actually Mothman and how much of it was people just capitalizing on, you know, the sightings to begin with. Well, what is, I mean, Mothman is, is our category category for whatever the heck this is anyway, you know, the um, flying humanoid stuff. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Or you know, big birds. Yeah. yeah. Thunderbirds, I mean, things like that. There's a lot of stuff that kind of folds into that mythology and, and, um, sort of, you know, encounter group. I, I don't know. To me, the Mothman was a very specific entity, you know, with the big wings, yeah. the red eyes, so on and so forth. What I was seeing in Chicago was more the flying humanoid stuff. And like I said, I had the feeling that people were just making up accounts too, or misidentifying things. Yeah. Although there were apparently, um, plenty of accounts of headed Mothman around Point Pleasant as well. Right. Um, right. It wasn't always the big eye- eyeball shoulders. <laughs> so and I'm yeah. sure the shape is, was somewhat morphic, you know, like most of these things are. They're never exactly the same to two witnesses. Right, right, exactly. I always wondered if that was, you know, when they first saw it, they, they called it the bird. Mm. Right, right. And it was. Everybody's heard. It was the bird. It was the big bird. And then somebody for, I think it was uh, UPI. I don't think it was AP. I think it was a UPI reporter called it Mothman. And then people started seeing it with a head because men have heads. Oh yeah. Yeah. Again, it's, Mm. it's how language changes our perception and it's also kind of a co-creation kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, you look at the grays, you know, grays were not the dominant entity until communion was a bestseller, which skeptics. And that book cover. Yeah, and books and, and skeptics will say, well, that's because people are making it up or they're imagining it, but it's that this stuff is not what it seems. See, but this is this is where I 
this is where I, I think I've mentioned this before. So if we're treading familiar ground, tell me to shut up. But like, it was it was kind of emerging in the seventies too, you know, with Close Encounters oh, of the Third oh, yeah. Kind yeah. and, yeah, and yeah. stuff like that too. Um, but the the bulk of UFO experience, you know, of encounters suddenly became grays after um, communion, whereas prior well, yeah, it became that, it, became, de- it became default. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Whereas prior, people only, are still. S- and they only, are still seeing the Venusians, though. Yeah, the, and, the long-haired space hippies. And the other interesting thing is that that only became the default in countries where communion was was published. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, it, it's also interesting how the like the image of the gray shares honestly kind of very little in common with the communion face. Yeah. yeah. Except the general yeah. shape of the head, but like. The color is different. The description it from from the book is completely different. It's definitely something about that that image and those giant almond shaped eyes that grabbed a hold well, of people. And and Whitley said that one of his primary misgivings about it was that uh, the alien the the face on the front of communion was too alien, mm. uh, which I think is and not telling. Not <clears throat> enough. Uh, not bug like enough. Isn't that something that no, he said? No, more. There was a, he said that there was this profound humanity from this figure that mm, that image okay. does not does not capture. Which makes you wonder if communion was never published, how would everything we study have changed? Oh wow! All aliens would look like Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> we would have well, never lost our elves. I, you know, if when I was a kid, I remember reading, you know. Uh, Jim and Coral Lorenzen's books and, you know, all, all the old stuff. And I remember the Pascagoula aliens creeped me out mm. so horribly. Just just the, the weird with the pointy things sticking out of their heads like a mummy wrapped around. Oh, I didn't like that. And, and I remember, you know, thinking, why are there so many different shapes? Yeah. Right. Well, you know, I was, you know, 10, 11 years old. I, I couldn't figure out why they, they came in so many shapes. I was like, well, you know, there's something, something hinky about this. That's because well, you know, there are he, thousands of races of aliens all oh God. really interested in Earth <laughs> for some reason. Well, I mean, so what I find really interesting, and I'm, 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 I'm just wanting to unload about all the stuff that I've been thinking about <laughs> in the writing of the book, so I'll try to keep my mouth shut, but... So num- number yeah, one, yeah, don't give away all the goods, dude. Right? Yeah, I know. They are predominantly humanoid to a fault, and I think that speaks yes. volumes. Um, and they fall into predominantly three categories: humans, greys, or therianthropes. Time and again, therianthropes, mm. um, which I think also speaks volumes. You know, you've got an alien life form from Zebel Ganubi that looks like a cross between a human and a mantis. It's like, no, that's the odds of that happening are just, Oh yeah. Yeah. You know. It's also star Trek's fault. <laughs> yes. well, uh, unless Josh, the odds of that are, are astronomical. Unless we live in a truly infinite universe, in which case it's a certainty. Oh, true. Hey, yeah. Also true. Well, and also, you know, the humanoid thing, I think there's a, an argument to be made that, uh, that, any any gravity capable of supporting life will most easily be navigated by a bipedal form. <laughs> you know, possibly that po- possibly that is a prerequisite for intelligent life that we don't we haven't wrapped our minds I around mean, yet. I don't possibly. Think so. I, I don't I think don't so know. either. But I would I would much more easily accept the idea that aliens look like crabs than they look like people. Yeah, radial oh, symmetry yeah. rather than Radio. bilateral. Right. Yeah. Or I mean, like, there's. I don't know this. I love this conversation because so many different people have such different takes on it, and um, it's it, it is preposterous to me that so many aliens or extraterrestrials that people see would would be you know humanoid looking, but it's also like you know I mean, of course they are right. And what what does that tell us? It doesn't. It doesn't tell us anything about life that you know develops on other planets probably it tells us something about our own psyche and about you know and probably about what it is that people are seeing 
and in my meaning, you know, in my opinion, it's it's probably not extraterrestrial life forms. Well, also, you know, the yes. other place we get this variety of forms is from cave paintings that shamans made over mm-hmm. the centuries uh, that are the exact same thing. I mean, it's, it's, it's buried into our mythology as well, which suggests this stuff is from altered states of consciousness. No, it suggests that aliens visited shamans, Soraya. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the other option. Um, well, I mean, but, there are um, shamans with, you know, antennas sticking out of their space helmets, so, you know. Well, I mean, and, and to be fair, there are some shamans, there are some indigenous traditions, especially in the Americas, that make yes. no bones about the fact that, yeah, I mean, Sky they, people. They, they, yeah. They, they flirt with the ancient alien things in a in a big way, um, yeah. at least, or at least panspermic sort of ideas. But then you run into this, you know, this confusing conflation of ancestors, meaning our descendants and living members of a progenitor race and spirits and mm-hmm. you know, all sorts of stuff. It just gets it gets confusing pretty quick. Right, right. And well, then of so, course, you're, you're also translating it from one language to another. <sighs> Right. At minimum. This, this is, sorry, uh, this is making me think of something, um, hang on, I'm still putting it together in my head. Uh, sky people, right? And and we're talking about, um, you know, aliens or extraterrestrials or flying humanoids or whatever. And all these things tend to be associated with, um, if not space, then at the very least, the air, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And also, so are the wild hunt. Mm-hmm. But there's this other thread of fairy lore and and other things like that that are subterranean yeah that mm-hmm. are kind of emerging from the earth and it, it made me think of this um i think it was a story on strange familiars where the um the person who's telling the story had encountered these creatures that she described as uh, alien looking and basically she was under the impression that they were from some other planet or, or something like that. And, and that they came, you know, from the sky and they very indignantly told her, no, we are, we're we are from of the, the earth. earth. Right. I remember exactly. that episode. Yeah, yeah. That was, yeah. Yeah. To be sure. Yeah. And, and I remember it's, it's that. Interesting. As soon as it's I heard that, that, I was like, well, there's the lower world in, in most shamanic cultures, there's the underworld or the lower world. And then there's the middle world and that's where humans live. And then the, the lower world, you have ancestors living there. You have, um, you know, the little people live there. Um, you have animal spirits that that live there. And then in the middle world, you do have spirits that are there, but they most often come from the lower world up. Okay. And then you have the upper world, and that's where the sky people are. Right. And the sky people can be deities. They can be, you know, different kinds of ancestors. The, the, the sky people are always, to me, that's the sketchiest and the most diffuse version, depending upon what culture yeah. you're talking about. The middle and lower are pretty consistent. Well, well, and so that raises two questions, one of which you just answered. The, for the first one is, what about deities, right, which you said? Right more often associated with the sky or kind of that upper mm. um, world. And and then my other question was going to be not to, to um, be too obvious, but where do the clowns come from? There they, we go. <laughs> come from below or do they come from above or do they come from this middle world? Well, see they're tricksters, so they can probably come from any of them, <sighs> yeah. but I know the Hopi they're, they're clown figures. The, the yeah. ones that are, coated in mud they come from the lower realm okay so that, that's the one that keeps popping into my head because i years ago when i was in a, a spirituality class in college we watched some videos on the hopi people and and their practices in general and a big part of it that always stuck with me was that sort of clown figure and like they you know they'd have people um dressed up in, in do these ceremonies and festivals and whatnot. And it always like, it's, it's this interesting, uh, like it's almost, it's almost creepy, but there's, there's an element of frivolity to it and an mm-hmm. element of, of fun, but it's like, it's also taboo and it's, it's sort of this, um, very androgynous and, uh, and ambiguous kind of figure that comes into 
the 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 real world, right? The the living mm-hmm. world. Mm-hmm. And you're saying they those are from the ground. They're from the earth, essentially. Mm-hmm. Right. That's why they they have mud all over them. Okay. But I yes. mean, in in other cultures, it's it's different. So right, you know. Yeah. And and again, you know, Barbara alluded to this, but like, regardless, as tricksters and masters of the threshold, so you can come from anywhere they damn well please. I would imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. Or tell you they do. Or they're the ones who go between worlds easily, like Hermes. Hermes is a trickster. Mercury is a trickster. He's the one who goes between the underworld and the world of men and Mount Olympus and back and forth most right. easily of any of the the Greek gods. So right, but where do they come from? That. Well, you know. Okay, I'm writing a novel about that, but I'm not going <laughs> to. Yeah, let's, oh my gosh, I'm not going to tell everything. Yeah, let's let's zero on the clowns because I'm kind of I'm I'm I kind of feel like I'm giving away too much stuff right now. <laughs> well, I don't like clowns, but I don't like grays either. So, and to me, they're very similar yeah. because they have that white or pasty or you know kind of grayish skin that looks dead. And then they have the blacked out eyes. I, I just don't like them. They creep me out. I, I, that was I, something. I, sorry, go ahead, Scry. I was going to say, I only know one clown, and he doesn't really do the clown thing anymore. Oh, like in real life? Yeah, he used to say, he was crappy the clown. He used to sing for punch drunk monkeys. Oh, okay. Yeah, you put the image the in, up, in the yeah. Slack, I think. Yeah. Uh, no, that was a whole vi- That was a video. Oh, gotcha. Okay. I he was, not, he uh, was an intentionally drunk, awful clown. Okay. See, that's he'd probably be okay for me because that's, you know that's what he, most he people sings say. in a band. They're supposed to be like that. I think it's the whole kids are supposed to like clowns, but some of us look at them and go, "Nope, <laughs> nope." Yep. The smile that's painted on, no matter how they feel on the inside, creeped me out. Didn't like it. Nope. I don't blame you. Never bothered uh, me. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. It's a comp. I was talking about sort of the um, my odd feelings about clowns. I don't. I don't hate them. I'm not really scared by them, but I think that there are some that get excessively creepy and are like just too much. But um, growing up, you know, it's sort of it's very neutral about clowns. Obviously, Stephen <laughs> King. Stephen King knew how to capitalize on that with it. Right. Yeah. Mm. You know. You know the funniest and poltergeist. Uh, right. Again, stop me if I'm saying this or I'm repeating myself, but I, I'll, I'll never forget thumbing through one of Catherine Briggs's encyclopedias of fairies and stumbling upon, I mean, a fairy is such a big umbrella term, so probably not fairy, but like stumbling upon some, something that was called in like, La- like Lancashire or some, somewhere, uh, a bit of folklore about like a fairy analog that they just called it that would look like your deepest, darkest fears. And I'm like, Oh, well, there you go, Steve. I guess. Yep. Yep. Interesting. (laughs) He probably did read that. And I remember, I think it was Lauren Coleman in mysterious America talks about the, the random weird hitchhiking clowns. Oh, screw those guys. And then there was the clown apocalypse thing, you know, that happened a few years ago. I think Taylor mentioned before we started, uh, talking. Yeah. 20. Yeah. yeah. 2015, 2016. There was some earlier than that too, like oh, 2012. Yeah. yeah. There, there, there've been random clown flaps for a long time. I mean, I remember some in the seventies. So oh my God, clown flaps. It's yeah, amazing. It's, well, yeah. I mean, it sounds like something in their outfit that, you know, is there for convenience, but <laughs> my clown you know. flaps. let me search my clown flaps. <laughs> Uh, but uh yeah i mean there was the the van full of clowns i think in massachusetts and that was either in 2012 or 2016 it was a gray van they were driving around and and driving near schools and stuff i remember well, it, that it takes very little imagination to to find some overlap between the clown stuff and, and mib stuff mhm um please uh, you know well i mean so You've got, uh, if, if, you know, they, they, they seem just as ephemeral, like you try to track them down or try to track down the, uh, the clown van <laughs> and it disappears down a dead end street and you can't mm-hmm. find it just like the MIB or like, you know, a lot of these descriptions of MIB, um, 
have uh, you know, it's very apparent that they're wearing makeup. Um, sometimes that they're wearing lipstick. Um, yeah. yeah. So that, that, for the record, I don't like those guys either. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm very prejudiced. Where, 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 where does the insane clown posse fit into all this? Oh, they're all right. <laughs> Man, Again, they're they're a band. They're supposed to be outrageous and weird. Magnets, how do they work? <laughs> how do <laughs> magnets work? Oh, magic. That's how they work. There you go. <laughs> it is. It's magic. Um you know oh, we've I kind just, of I just thought of something. Yeah. So Harlequin, right? Yes. What is he seen wearing? What does he wear? Checkered. Red oh. and black. Oh. White and black. <laughs> What does Flannel Man wear? Yeah, yeah. what's yeah. going on with that? Yeah, I think I think you might be onto something with that. What are the um? Let's see. What? Are, well, yeah. What are the associations with those colors? Uh, like real primally, I guess black is like earth, and red is blood. Yes. Well, Tim's Tim's Life been saying that. Tim's yeah. been saying that he's been hitting a, a dead end with with this thing, but maybe he's just he's just looking at the. Uh, the tartan aspect and the buffalo plaid as opposed to this this harlequin aspect look at the shape and look how the the colors balance right um again you've got the masonic lodges that have the black and white tiled inlaid floors because it's a balance mm-hmm. of opposites and if you if you there's a uh Masinque, I believe is Algonquin and they have masks of it and it it's a Bigfoot figure, but the masks are black on one side and red on the other. Hmm. Again, balance. Huh. And maybe, it's, you know, when people have these flannel man encounters, maybe they're just, I mean, again, this stuff is morphic. It's not specifically a, an exact thing. And they're seeing that black and red. And instead of a Harlequin, they're seeing a, uh, a flannel man. So well, look, People are scared of clowns now, right? So maybe Flannel Man is less scary than a clown. True. Maybe a lumberjack dude is way less scary. I, well, would, I, I would put up with that better, except then I'd be wondering about why is this dude in my house? Right, right. And that doesn't help. So. Well, I still think there's. I still think a thread for Tim to pull on with the Flannel Man thing is the. Uh, the Odinic archetype, I think, is mm-hmm. that has some has some weight in that too, or has some, has some role to play in that. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I, I don't want to uh, rain on this black and red parade, but I, I've been googling it here on the side. And um, when did that motif with Harlequins show up? Because all I'm finding on it really seems to be dating back to or tracing back to. Harley Quinn. I'm, I'm guessing it's, mm. it predates her, but what I'm seeing, I, I Googled traditional Harlequin outfit and it's I'm seeing black and white. Yeah. So yeah, so I saw, I saw black and white and I'm seeing another one that's really got me thinking, which is um, basically diamonds of primary colors. So red, yellow, green, and mm-hmm. blue. And um, that is used in uh, in this uh, King in Yellow campaign that I'm running as a, a character wearing sort of a, a costume that looks just like this. Um, yeah, the colorful ones come in with Commedia dell'arte. Okay. Yeah. And then when it comes into France, they tended to wear black and white, and it was more of an elegant thing. And Harlequin became this more romantic figure. Okay. And, and less violent and and uh buffoonish and gluttonous that makes um, sense. but in commedia dell'arte he's he's very gluttonous and buffoonish and somewhat violent very like uh the fool almost mm-hmm. like the, like traditional like le fou kind of right or like we're like false death or something right mm-hmm. yeah interesting uh indeed and we we had also mentioned briefly there there's certainly some questions but the the Harlequin story there from what's his name Dan Mitchell yeah I've always had issues with that um, but it became a very popular story at one point it's creepy I remembered it I didn't remember his name but I as soon as it's mentioned I always go oh that yeah that that's creepy <laughs> yeah that stuck with me. 
for a while. And anyone um, want to give an overview of that real quick? Well, I, I just encountered it for the first time when it was shared the other day. And I mean, <sighs> well, so yeah, so Jason Offit and Brad Steiger had sort of talked to, uh, to Mitchell and apparently from his, uh, from his childhood, he reported interactions with this being that he ascribed to being the Harlequin, um, always with a permanent expression on its face of surprise and, uh, walking with almost like marionetted head movements, um, androgynous figure that seemed to follow him, perhaps members of his family, including his father and his child. Um, and, uh, has a like, round yeah. mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody else take it from here. <laughs> has a round mouth and big open eyes. Like it's perpetually surprised. And Which like is it's hard, saying, yeah. Oh, it, it is absolutely horrifying. And I, I just got to say, ever since I read that, I read it in the morning and I think I made a comment. When I yeah. read it, like, man, I'm sure glad I'm not reading this at night because I would be uh, absolutely terrified. I've been terrified every night since then, uh, <laughs> yeah, walking around my house in the dark. It's, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a fun story. I, I remember telling Morgana to, or I read it aloud to her, and she's like, "Shut up, stop! Why are you reading this to me? Yeah, oh my God, Mom, story. stop!" But I mean, you know, harlequins and clowns are a staple in alien abductions as well. Like children will often, you know, screen memories or not, um, say that they're taken by. Things like pirates and clowns and witches. And, oh, sure, sure, because they don't allow yeah. us to define them, or or that's mm. or or they're providing a very accurate account of their perception. You know? True, true. Yeah, yeah. No, totally. Yeah. Well, this uh, just kind of a strange question, but that made me think of this. Um, Jeff Ritzman has a story from I think it was uh, I don't want to butcher, it, but I think it was his seventh birthday, where mm. this person came into his room i don't remember exactly but i thought he had said that that thing was dressed in a certain way that was almost clownish is am i making that up am i filling in blanks in my head there i don't remember that one okay that sounds that sounds vaguely familiar but i i can't say for certainty It, it stuck with me it had large eyes and it came in and like clapped and when it clapped it there was a super loud yes, gong noise or yes like i do remember the clapping part yeah but I, I don't remember i'd have to go back and, and re-listen to that um yeah i don't know yeah i don't remember the detail i mean it's been a long time since i did that first three-part show with jeff um but yeah like the clap was like unreal loud and thunderous and kind of changed everything yeah, yeah, that story I don't know really stuck with me for some reason. But when you said clowns involved in like alien abductions, that's you know that made me think of that. Um, so I'm not sure why, but um, yeah, you know, and th- with this story, this Harlequin story, I guess to kind of keep going on that thread for a minute. Th- so the idea was that um, this thing had sort of um, you know. I don't know, visited him when he was a kid at night. And the way he talks about it at the beginning makes it sound like it didn't scare him. But later on, and definitely as, as you know, the description becomes more apparent, it, it becomes clear that it was very scary. Mm. Um, and it started showing up in his life, you know, throughout, um, throughout his adult uh, experiences and and even throughout like you know um teenage years and stuff in ways that were increasingly like just terrifying uh, and it kind of culminates in this sort of um you know which which so it's a three part story on mysterious universe and i think the last part is where he describes um going to meet it right and having a conversation and in the story it says this morning as if as if this had just happened. So I don't know. I mean, I have some doubts about the veracity of the story, Yeah, uh, but who knows? It's really creepy. It, 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 it might have some basis in, in a real experience that I, I feel like a lot of those things do like someone had a real experience, but then they, they added to it. Um, or it's just really creepy fiction. I mean, yeah, I have a question. Creepy pasta, yeah. Didn't 
the didn't the creature give his name to him as the tooth fairy? Yes. Yeah. All initially, right. Yeah. So, okay. So I didn't catch this at the time that it came out because I hadn't read this novel when this came out, but there is a novel that's not very well known in the United States, but is fairly well known in the UK and the author is Graham Joyce. And if you guys haven't read any of his stuff, you should, because he was an amazing writer. And he his his fantasy is really rooted in folklore. It's very dark. Um, it's it's really really good. And there is a novel called The Tooth Fairy. And I will read you just this first bit of the plot synopsis. Five-year-old Sam loses a tooth and puts it under his pillow. That night, he's visited by a sprite he assumes to be the tooth fairy. But it's not the childhood myth. It is a mischievous, foul-mouthed creature who taunts and teases Sam. The androgynous fairy who changes its gender from time to time becomes obsessed with Sam and is both hurtful to and protective of him. Sam grows up with his friends, Clive and Terry, in Coventry, England in the 1960s, And the fairy visits Sam frequently, often disrupting his life and those of his friends. Hmm. And when was that published? This was published in 1998, but it is not very well known in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating because that's all. I mean, those are several hallmarks. Yeah. There's, there's, there's some threads in there that are very similar. Now it's possible he read it and then it kind of melded with his, I'm not saying he plagiarized it. I'm not being mean. I'm just saying maybe some of it got mixed in with his memories. Yeah. I mean, it is possible or, he plagiarized it. Or he plagiarized it. I'm, I'm just trying to be polite or and nice. J- just to throw a third option out there, you know, it, one of those two is probably more likely, but, or he didn't read it, doesn't know about it, and somehow the same yeah. thread of, of, Whatever that is, the muse, creativity, uh-huh. you know, this yeah. thing melted into both uh, Graham Joyce and this guy. Yeah. And yeah. It, wouldn't, it wouldn't really be plagiarism. It would actually be uh, just stealing the, the concept. Yeah. Taking the idea and, and moving around with it. Yeah. And there are other similarities, as I remember, in the plot. But, you know, it's, it's a different story entirely. Right, right. But it could give, I mean, if you wanted to fake something. I mean, that certainly could have given them the idea. It's, we, it's we don't, possible. We don't know. I mean, we weren't there. We don't know what happens. Yep. That's 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 the bottom line. You can't ever know 100% because we're not the people who are having the experience. We yeah, and one of the things I am loath to do is ever tell somebody who's an experiencer that they didn't experience what they experienced. Yes, I exactly. Just, I'd I rather, I'd rather believe a lie. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, we're out of time, so we should continue this in the Patreon if you guys are all down. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And uh, Josh, where can people find you? JoshuaCutchen.com. How convenient. Uh, new blog post up yesterday, so for a change. <laughs> so give it a look. Uh, Taylor Bell, where can people find you? If you squint really hard, I might be behind you in the mirror. Ooh. Um, or also Green Line Podcast. Or uh, sigilarconum.com. All right. And Barbara? I can be found at sixdegreesofjohnkeel.com with podcast and blog. And we also have a Facebook page. So you can look us up there. All right. Awesome. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks. I would like to take a moment here to thank all of my Patreons. As we go into our 10th year, it is all of you that help keep this going and i would especially like to give a shout out to those of you pledging ten dollars or more allison cook super inframan stephen st george tim andrew nichols christine the hundredth monkey project a blue second gen mr2 drifting around a japanese mountain patricia guy Quinta, alex whitcomb american rambler andrew mains barbara fisher beverly williamson big boy limina charles davis Charles in Florida, land of the crazy and communicable. Chris Ernst, Chris Johnson, Craig Cicernos, Craig Parmenter, Crystal Ann Compton, David Moore, Denise Sarek, Diane B., Duffy Doubter, Edu Camahort, Empty K., Eric Citron, 
Eric Todd, J. Otto Bullitt, Matthew Sproul, Denise Sarek, James Lattimore, Joanna Rojas, John Bracken, Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kevin Shrek, Kristen L., Laser Printer Jam, Linz Jackson K., Luke Osborne, Mark Bowley, Mark Brady, Matt in Delaware, Patricia W., Paul Jeffries, Ray Benedetto, Riker and Stark, Roger Gonzalez, Sam Sharon, Stone Wilderness, Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, 36 Dingo, Thunderboy, Timothy Castaneda, Tyler Glimstead, Vincent Trewell, Walker, Will Gebhard, Will Powell, Ren Collier, Martinez Saint, and Stephen D. I thank you all so very much, and a special shout out to Vincent Trewell, who does our recaps every week and does a fantastic job. Thank you all. There is, of course, a Patreon segment attached to this show. Patreons, we'll get that later in the week. If you want to become a patron, again, it's only three bucks a month. You get all kinds of content all month long, and I'll see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.